Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for uh, being here. I'm Crosby Kemper, the director of the Kansas City Public Library. Um, we're grateful to the, uh, uh, to the Irish uh, Cultural Center, uh, the, the Kansas City Irish Center, excuse me, um, uh, and also New Letters on the Air for making uh, tonight, uh, tonight's uh, conversation with Anne and Wright uh, possible, which I'm personally very excited about because I'm a big fan of her writing. Um, tonight I have the honor of uh, uh, introducing Angela Elam, who uh, does New Letters on the Air, and I'm sure n uh, nobody in this audience uh, needs uh, an introduction to, to New Letters, the publication, uh, or, or New Letters on, on the Air, which is, I think, probably the most important uh, uh, lit literary interview program uh, that we have in the, in the United States. And, uh, and, and Angela will be interviewing uh, Anne Wright momentarily, and I'll, I'll call them up on the stage in a moment. Uh, but I do uh, want to say uh, a word or two about Anne and Wright's uh, writing, because I'm such a, uh, a big fan of it. Um, like, like much of uh, Irish writing, it's about adultery, child abuse, men who smell, uh, terminal ennui of uh, uh, Irish women who have to put up with Irish men who, uh, who smell the boredom that lurks in corners. Uh, as, as she says, uh, and, and the, the ability of Ireland uh, to, to make uh, everyone uh, miserable for just another little while. Um, <laughs> this is the chaos of our, uh, of our fate. One does understand why Yeats retreated to his tower and Joyce found Trieste so exciting uh, after, after one reads 20th century Irish literature, including uh, Anne Enright. But there's more in Anne Enright than, uh, than just the traditional uh, uh, McCourt view of the uh, uh, the oh, woe is me Ireland. There is this extraordinary, uh, this excruciatingly uh, extraordinary, uh, beautiful detail of her language, uh, and uh, uh, at, at the end of the day, uh, writing obviously is a, is about language. And whenever someone creates a new voice, and Anne Enright I think has done that. Uh, in her fiction, uh, it's an extraordinary thing. Uh, she says uh, uh, at one point in, in one of her novels, there's so few people uh, given us uh, to, to love that they all stick. Uh, there's so few great books, uh, great novels, uh, great writing uh, given us to love that they all uh, stick. Um, they are lovely, as she also says, beyond uh, usefulness. Um, and, and that's the way I think of her writing. And I'm not the only one. She has won a number of prizes. She's written for The New Yorker and The, uh, the Paris uh, Review. Uh, her short story collection, The Portable Version, won the Rooney Prize for, for Irish Literature. Uh, and, uh, of course, The Gathering uh, won the Man uh, Booker Prize uh, for fiction in 2007. Um, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to introduce our greatest uh, living interviewer, Angela Elam, uh, and Enright, perhaps Ireland's greatest living novelist. I want to thank you all for coming. This is wonderful to see you here. And uh, Crosby was so nice to mention new letters uh, and assume that everyone here knows what it is. But if you're not familiar with the publication, uh, we've got some magazines out out there next to the table with her books. So afterwards, while you're waiting in line to buy her books and have her sign them, then uh, you can peruse the magazine if you'd like to know a little more about it. It's a quarterly. And also, I have to brag a little bit. Crosby, I didn't tell you this, but um, as of, I think it's actually this date, uh, New Letters on the Air turned 35 years old. Can you believe that? When the radio show's been around that long. So, so anyway, it's a, an honor to have you here, and I'm really glad that you've joined us. Are we the beginning of your this little American tour for your paperback? It's is that... not so much a tour as a tourette. A tourette? <laughs> it's um, just five towns or something like that. Yes, and in Kansas, it's number one. Oh, good. Well, that's that sounds lovely. Um, Let's talk a little bit before we actually get into some of your books about your background because uh, you started out in the media, I read, that you've done a lot of things with media, some things with theater. Tell me a little yeah. bit about your background. Well, um, I, I, I worked in uh, TV for six years. I was a producer and director in Irish television for six years, just out of college. Um, I, I was just about to say that it was a mistake, but it wasn't really a mistake. It was uh, my, my mother is a demon for 
cutting ads out of newspapers and sending them to her children. Sometimes without any note or anything, you'd get this ghost-like little clipping in the post because she always thought we should have a job, a proper job. And um, <laughs> I was all set to be a writer and, and this clipping arrived in its bare envelope for a job in TV. And I had been working pretty much all the time in theatre, in student theatre in Trinity College Dublin and had worked a little bit on the fringe and travelled a bit with shows and stuff. So I was a kind of jack of all trades in the theatre and had done various things, including uh, acting actually. Um, and, uh, I, and then I got a job in TV and I was there for six years. But I had done an MA in creative writing in the University of East Anglia, which is a, a, a major creative writing programme in, in uh, Britain and I was going to be a writer, so the TV thing was a bit of a lay-by on the motorway of life, as far as I was concerned. And you, you are married to someone who's in theatre, is that I am, correct? I am yeah. married to that person. Um, uh, the, the, uh, it has recently been said that I was, I've been, I was married to him for 18 years before we had children, but in fact we knew each other for 18 years before we had children. Um, and uh, I, we met in, in Trinity, in the theatre there. Um, I don't know when we got married. I don't count. <laughs> I then, guess I was sometime. curious about all this because, you know, you've now written all these novels. You've got two, um, two books of short stories, mm -hmm. but you only have one play. And so I was, yeah, and, I think, and you have lots of dialogue in your stories, so it's... Yeah, I, I had been in a play by a woman called Carol Churchill, who's a wonderful British playwright, and I did a play called Top Girls with her, uh, by her, not with her, that would have been amazing. But she had a kind of dialogue thing, which was all about interruption. Um, and I read after the fact that there's a theory that women interrupt each other all the time, men are more territorial about how they exchange dialogue. She was taking this overlapping thing, so we all had to jabber at each other at the same time on the stage, very precisely. It was a kind of lesson in how even very natural dialogue is in fact a, a kind of mannered thing, David Mamet being another example of that. And I love the rhythm of good dialogue, and it's usually quite mannered dialogue, and use that a lot in my work. That's interesting, that sort of interruption, because when you look at the, uh, the novel, The Gathering, which, as he mentioned, it was the book that won the Man Booker Prize, there's not as much interruption of dialogue as there is interruption of scenes, you know, with us yeah. uh, juxtaposing what seems to be a thread of going on now to suddenly being in the past and then, you know, yeah. just that interruption of things. A kind of, a bit of a jazz, a bit of a rap. I don't know. Um, I don't write plays to answer your previous question, now that I've remembered what it is, because <laughs> I, I can't get people on stage and I can't get them off stage. I'm not entirely sure what the stage is, you know. Um, huh. So, and also I'm probably a bit territorial, or my husband is a bit territorial, that he does all of that stagey kind of stuff, and I stick to the word on the page. Um, yeah, in the gathering, the things are put side by side. There is a kind of classic narrative arc underneath this quite hectic structure. There is a quite a simple emotional arc or an emotional journey that Veronica takes, but I hang all these scenes on, on, on that structure. And I'm interested in the way things sit beside each other. I'm interested in the way if you move in a non-linear fashion, what it does to the reader's brain actually and the effects that you can get. There's a thing about a book, you have to read it page by page. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yes, um, you uh, and, you know, so I quite like to think of it spatially or, you know, sculpturally, a little bit, not to sound too fancy. Um, and I quite like disturbing the reader's idea of what should come next, because if something different comes next, then there's a different kind of thing that happens in your brain, and I'm kind of, looking for, I'm looking for disturbance maybe, or I'm looking for something else to settle um, by unsettling these readers' expectations. And it can drive the reader crazy. It particularly can drive the critic crazy because the critic likes to be in control of the book and the gathering just slips out of the reader's control all the time.
All the time, yeah. All the juxtapositions, I think, do that. But they, they certainly keep you on your toes as a reader, I think. Yeah, and um, it means that you don't hurry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> you have to take your time with yeah. it. Yeah. There was a, a very interesting short scene. Do you feel like reading a little bit this I, early I, on? I never object to reading. Okay. I, I picked something out that was short because we have a lot to talk about. And um, it involves a little bit of dialogue, but also, I, well, I'll let it speak for itself. It's chapter 26. Okay. All, all of it. All of it. It's just two pages, so. Emily turns her cat's eyes to me. How did Uncle Liam die, she says. He, he drowned, I say. How did he drown? He couldn't breathe in the water. In the seawater? Yes. It is important to be clear about these things. Emily needs to dismantle the world before she can put it together again. Rebecca's mind is a vaguer sort of machine. Anxiety sets her adrift. Sometimes I wish you'd focus up, but who's to say which is the better way to be? I can swim, says Emily. Yes, you can swim. You're a great swimmer. Couldn't he not swim? Sweetie, he didn't want to. Oh. Do you want a hug? No. No what? No thanks. Well, I want a hug. Come here and give your poor mother a hug. And she comes over with outstretched arms and a big fake smile for the poor mummy pantomime. I should think of her as selfish, but I don't. I think of her as utterly beautiful in her selfishness. I think it's okay to kill yourself, she says into my chest. You know, when you're old. It's hard to remember that they don't mean to hurt or don't know that they do. I push her back from me and I say in a fear -tick thickened shame on you voice, your uncle Liam was not old, Emily. He was sick. Do you hear me? Your uncle Liam was sick in his head. She lingers at my knee and draws with her fingernail in the smooth nylon of my tights. Like seasick sick. Oh, forget it all. I just forget it. She jumps in to hug me then, her victory won over all my concerns. And then she runs off to play. For a week, I compose a great and poetic speech for my children about how there are little thoughts in your head that can grow until they eat your entire mind. Just tiny little thoughts. They're like a cancer. There's no telling what triggers the spread or who will be struck and why some get it and others are spared. I'm all for sadness, I say. Don't get me wrong. I am all for the ordinary life of the brain. But we fill up sometimes like these, those little wooden birds that sit on a pole. We fill up with it until donk, we tilt into the drink. Hard, hard, <laughs> hard stuff. <laughs> That's just a little bit from The Gathering. I'm talking today with Anne Enright for New Letters on the Air, and that is her novel. This was your fourth novel? or I don't novel? count. You don't count. <laughs> <laughs> I don't count that either. It won Can't the Man remember. Booker Prize in 2007. That was lovely. That was a lovely reading. How many of you out here have read The Gathering? It's been out for a while, so quite a few of you, so you already know, for those of you who haven't, the, well, actually, I should have you talk a little bit about just a little synopsis of the book, so. Well, it's just the journey that Veronica, the narrator, takes after the death of her brother by suicide, and um, it started out as a great epic that began in 1926 and went on to 2002, but the epic it was going to be a big, friendly, baggy book, you know, and everything was going to be really simple, and it was just going to happen that way. But the it, the structure of it kept on falling apart for me, and then I built that falling apart into the book and made it the truth of the book. Um, my original research had been on the fall of Monto, which was the red light district in Dublin in 1922, which was cleaned out by the crusading uh, Legion of Mary, who reformed the prostitutes there. Uh, I'm, I'm not against 
taking women off the streets. I thought it was kind of interesting, an interesting moment in Catholicism. I was interested in the rise of Irish respectability. I didn't know how we got from Joyce, you know, to um, a country that couldn't, well, you know, to, to what we wear now, which was a much more conservative, when I was growing up in the 70s anyway, a much more conservative country. So I was interested in the rise of that respectability. Anyway, all these grand thoughts were part of the book and I had this idea about Liam walking into the sea in Brighton and um, I knew why he died and I, uh, all of that was natural to me. I was working on some bigger idea. But in fact, you know, that is the, that's the book, is, is Veronica's grief, grief after Liam dies. The grief of the witness, you know, the one who's standing by. Yeah. Uh, you definitely feel it in there. It's also interesting, you know, you talk about this, um, the history of getting the prostitutes off the street because there's all this am ambiguity about Veronica's grandmother. Well, you know, was she a, yeah. a prostitute? Was she not? I mean... Did, there's that slight kind of idea that she might have been in, in Veronica's mind. Um, and I had started out with the idea that this was going to be the book. Um, I knew what happened to Liam. And I was looking for the original sin. I was looking for the first cause. And I was looking for it in the fall of Monto. Uh, this was very, very early on before, before, the, before there was, this was the false book, you know, that is not the, the real book that is now. And I realized that you can't um, blame somebody's grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> You, you can't so we turn. You know, the sh I was interested in shame and poverty and all these things, but you couldn't um, make the story about, about about what it was going to be. This was a this was a thing in Veronica's head. This was a fantasy that she had, or a monster. It was a it was a phantasmagoria, you know, um, or it was true. So I kept that little balance in there. Yeah. You know. Um, just for fun. A lot of the book had that too, you know, that's what I thought was sort of fun about yeah. reading. Well, fun might be the wrong word to use. No, it's a good so word. Sure. <laughs> no, but I mean, there be monsters for sure. It is a very dark book and it's a very stained sort of book. Um, I was slightly interested in writing uh, about sex in a way that men often write about sex as if it's a terrible thing. <laughs> So I did that too. You've mentioned Joyce, and a lot of critics have brought up um, James Joyce. And how much do you think his literature has affected you? Um, um, I really don't know. I, I really don't know. I mean, uh, influence is a very hard thing to trace. Um, I, I read Joyce as a teenager, and um, so there it is, you know. You haven't gone back and read him? Oh, no, I've read him since, you know. I used to read Ulysses every five years, and then I go, shh. <laughs> bother. Uh, it's an interesting book to read every so often because it, you, you, it, it's like, it, it's about how you have changed. Yeah. Uh, when you do that. If you come back 10 years after or whatever, see it and you. He's very good, you know. He's really yeah. very good. He's got a lot of fans in yeah, this country, too. Yeah, but there's a good reason for that. He's really very good. I, and The Dead is a huge influence in, in my work. The last story in Dubliners, the last paragraph of The Dead where the snow is falling and all over Ireland. But actually, that last paragraph is responsible for more bad lyricism in Irish <laughs> writers' work than any <laughs> other series of sentences. <laughs> Because everybody does it. I mean, they, you know, I, I, I wish I could quote it directly, but everything is falling, falling. Whatever this uh, play of, 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 of repetition throughout the paragraphs is, it, it, throughout that paragraph is reproduced by everyone all the time, and you have to stop it. You have to excise it from your work. You know? Yeah. Well, it is interesting how much um, d death plays a part in, in your works. I mean, in The Forgotten Waltz and the center of it. And I don't know, how many people here have read The Forgotten Waltz? Oh, just a couple of you. So I don't want to give away too much. Um, but we, we deal with familial death. But I guess that's a part of life. So why is that not so odd? But um, I'm just wondering... Um, 
Well, Gina in The Forgotten Waltz says we're not funeral types, basically. Right, she, right. She, she makes it quite clear, and I, I, I suspect possibly class-based distinction. Um, oh, it's a very different funeral from the funeral in the gathering. Oh, definitely. Uh, they don't cry. They check that their foundation is okay. But one they of do the, it properly. One of the things that I love what you do in, in your writing is that you will set something up, and somebody, uh, one of the critics that I was reading uh, described your work, and I, I agree with this, that it's very cinematic. And when you were saying you didn't know how to get people on and off stage, mm -hmm. I thought, well, there's that cinematic thing for you. You know, you don't have to worry about getting them off on and off stage. Yeah, in, in that you just sort of go way. there. I mean, a lot of writing and the work of writing is trying to get people across town on a bus. You know, it's just like technical difficulties of how you're going to move your characters around or whatever. And I often say to students, just have them on the other side of town. You just start on the other side of town. <laughs> and, you know, forget about the bus. The bus can be hugely interesting. But if you're not interested in the bus, don't do the bus, you know. Yeah. But actually, it's American writers who taught me how to do that. Oh, really? Yeah, well, I mean, I remember early on writing, I would take down Donald Barthelm's stories and just see how he moved, which was at, without looking back, you know? <laughs> So if you're stuck at a transition, I just look at a few pages of that and you could do anything you wanted, such freedom. Yeah, oh, that's interesting. Oh, he was a great short story writer, yes. I thought. I have to go back to him sometime soon, oh. yeah. Oh. Um, you have uh, a way of planting things throughout your work that we don't, you know, you'll, you'll give us an idea of something that's coming up, but you don't necessarily have to finish it right then, it's just, planting the notion and then it doesn't come back again until much later. And I thought I would have you read, and may, maybe you want to talk a little bit about The Forgotten Waltz, because it's it's a very different time in Ireland that this is set. I mean, it's yeah. during the boom time, right? When you Yeah, it's out. interesting. Veronica, at the end of the gathering, is going to buy the house in Broadstone, and she's going to put wide oak planking on the floor and she's going to get she's going to redo it it's 2002 her husband is leaving her little notes on the table saying look at this house why don't we you know that that was a kind of thing a woman at home might do as an alternative you know to get her uh, a, a career going again she would do houses um so although it reaches back to 2006 it was set very strongly in 2002 i mean she has a perfect life her 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 house is all limestone, sandstone, slate, um, and she's got rid of the horrible curtains and it's all blinds and everything's perfect. So uh, a mere whisper of time later in the Forgotten Waltz, it's 2009, and that crazy kind of construction phase <laughs> has come to an end. Um, and I did, my books are often contemporary, so um, it, it, it does, it, the research is much easier if all you have to do <laughs> is look out the window. And, um, but to, in 2009, the economy collapsed in 2008 and nobody realised that it was, that it had collapsed or the extent of the fall. In all 2009, when I was writing this book, there was this feeling of going down in a lift with no idea of where the ground floor was. There was a vertigo, a slow motion, a lot of denial, uh, a lot of talk about soft landings, a lot of dread, um, and a kind, I would, I, I hesitate to call it a beauty, but a melancholy about that fall, which um, I found extremely sad and urgent and I just couldn't avoid it so I set the book at that time after the fall um, which was the title that I couldn't use clearly <laughs> <laughs> after the fall but uh, that that sense of melancholy is, is in the book because Gina who's the protagonist and narrator is looking back on a very hectic and wonderful affair with Sean uh, Valerie the love of her life and now uh, they're living together uh, in her mother's house which is unsellable after her mother's death um, and the snow is falling and it's set on February the 6th 2009 which was in Ireland a day of snow and um, I 
decided to set it on that day. Just, I think just when the economy really did not need to grind to a halt, the country ground to a halt. And it was, I took a journey with my family that day and, and it was a, ex extremely beautiful. Um, and I just wanted to, to capture that idea of a moment of grace. Uh, that comes towards the end of the book. So the second half of the book is set on the day of the 6th of February, 2009, oh. which my brother then told me, said, that's my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> and you had forgotten this? I'm not good on <laughs> <laughs> And we should say, too, that Gina uh, is working in IT. I mean, she's... She's working in one of those vague jobs that's really hard to describe. And, uh, but what she is doing, what their company is doing, Rathlin Communications, is putting European uh, language, European-based companies on the English language web. So she, she has languages, that's one of her things. She, uh, she does the beer countries, not the wine. She, does, uh, <laughs> so she has German and... Uh, um, so I, I needed someone who was interested in language. Um, so it was interesting building her CV. But actually, the CV was the second thing. I mean, what I knew, uh, looking out the window on the, on the evening of February the 6th, was just I, I knew where she had been. I knew what was, what, 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 I knew what her problem was. And once you know that, the emotional problem of the book is, the rest of it is just fun. Right. Well, I was going to have you read something else, but it occurred to me that it might be nice to hear you read the preface of the book because it's, it's, oh, yeah. it's beautifully written. Is and it? I think it was repeating, but there you go. Okay. If it hadn't been for the child, then none of this might have happened. But the fact that a child was involved made everything that much harder to forgive. Not that there is anything to forgive, of course, but the fact that a child was mixed up in it all made us feel that there was no going back, that it mattered. The fact that a child was affected meant that we had to face ourselves properly. We had to follow through. She was nine when it started, but that hardly matters. I mean, her age hardly matters because she was always special. Isn't that the word? Of course, all children are special. All children are beautiful. I always thought Evie was a bit peculiar, I have to say, but also that she was special in the old-fashioned sense of the word. There was a funny, off-centre beauty to her. She went to an ordinary school, but there was, even at that stage, an amount of ambivalence about Evie, the sense of things unsaid. Even the doctors, especially the doctors, kept it vague with their wait and see. So there was a lot of anxiety around Evie, too much, I thought, because she was also a lovely child. When I got to know her better, I saw that she could be cranky or lonely. I questioned her happiness. But when she was nine, I thought of her as a beautiful, clear little person, a kind of gift, too. And when she saw me kissing her father, when she saw her father kissing me in his own house, she laughed and flapped her hands, a shrill, unforgettable hoot. It was a laugh, I thought later, mostly of recognition but also of spite or something like it, glee perhaps. And her mother, who was just downstairs, said, Evie, what are you doing up there? Making the child glance back over her shoulder. Come on down now. And some miracle of her mother's voice, so casual and controlled, made Evie think that everything was all right, despite the fact that I had been kissing her father, not for the first time either, though, I now think of it as the first real time, the first official occasion of our love on New Year's Day 2007, when Evie was still pretty much a child. You see, I mean, actually, what we have, again, that nobody's noticed, is uh, uh, a scene in which a child over, you know, uh, eavesdrops or sees the primal scene, as it were, or some version of it. And I was thinking, oh, here we go again. You're always doing the same thing. <laughs> Do you realize when you're writing that you're doing that? Oh, I, I was mean, like halfway you're... through when I said, oh, God, here, I've done it again. Yeah, but... <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you know, uh, it's an important... The primal scene is the primal scene. It's, it's a, an important in part of the engine of our imaginings. And... Uh, so I'm, it's a fairly respectable thing to be interested in.
And it's a very different story. I mean, it may have some of the same elements, but it's such a different, a different story yes. than The Gathering, so. Yes, I wanted to do something that the reader would enjoy, very simply. Um, and uh, so I see all the similarities between the work, but uh, it is uh, a, a very straightforward, or very straightforward narrative. Yeah, I should ID that. That was Anne Enright reading the preface to her novel, The Forgotten Waltz, and you're listening today to New Letters on the Air. I forgot to tell you guys we're recording this to air, so you're, if you're wondering well, who the hell is she talking to, that's what <laughs> I'm letting people know. So, <laughs> um, so with, when you are writing, tell us a little bit, because you were able to quit after your very first book was published, Quit, not quit writing, but quit your day job and start writing full time. I read that. Is that is that correct? Able to is a little exaggeration, perhaps. I mean, I um, <laughs> no. I mean, they, I had a very uh, small uh, succès d'estime. I think is what they call uh, the success of my first book. Uh, it was hardly a financial bonanza. It was called The Portable Virgin, and it was a book of short stories. Yes, I had. I was. I, I wrote at the weekends because I was busy in my TV life, in my media life, and I suppose I was building a an exit. You know, so uh, once I had that established, I knew I could exit and have a become be a, a, have a, a career. I suppose as a writer. So after six years of a proper job, you realized that you did want to go back to your original No, I dream. just couldn't stand the job anymore. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, I mean, the writing was always there, but no, it was untenable. It was absolutely untenable. There was no way I could continue. I was very busy, <laughs> um, very frantic, and you, you were obliged to be extremely ambitious for nothing much, you know, Yeah. in TV. And it's a lot like that in this country, too. I, mean, I think it's a pretty <laughs> universal problem. So, uh, I, 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 yes, I left and worked quite hard, with, with, to no effect, really, for the next seven years or so. I, I really only started writing, I really only got m momentum um, from maybe to the year 2000 on, which is from when I had m my children um, and moved out of town and uh, just worked all the time. Yeah. I'm very, ha very happy to be working all the time, but I had no room for the anxieties of the writing life because I was too busy for them. In other, you know, too busy with small children. So, and, uh, so I just had to write. And I, and I stopped worrying about everything. When you write, this has to be everything. You know, it has to be the most amazing thing ever. And I hadn't, I didn't have room for that anxiety anymore. I just had to throw that in the, in the trash. Well, which is that right. is so interesting that children could help. In a way, you would think that once you had children, you would be so busy that you wouldn't have time to write. But in a way, it organized your life. It did organize my life fantastically, and it also took a lot of my grandiosity. Went into the children. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't they wonderful? You know, I've done this, you know, this great thing by having these children. Um, and it took a lot of that out of my writing. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. Because I read that you would try to plan when you were going to write, that you would, um, if, if they were taken care of for a certain amount of time, you would block out how much you could sleep yeah. and how much you could write. And yeah, or I wrote when, uh, when, when they were babies, they were at home with me all, that all, all day. Um, and so they would go to sleep, but babies sleep all the time. That's a little known thing about babies, but they really do sleep enormous amounts of hours. So you put them down for the afternoon and say, I'll get two hours. The baby might sleep for four, and you'd be typing faster at the end of two hours because the baby's going to wake up any minute, and you had to get that last, <laughs> you know, and all the inspiration comes just, well, inspiration is not a word I use often, but all your thoughts come just when it's too late. So I had two hours of too late, you know, enormous amounts of work happened in, in those, <laughs> those, you know, it's like knitting faster before you run out of wool, you know, yeah. and uh, <laughs> jumpers, scarves, you know. 
<laughs> is this what what got you going? I mean, you've you've written your novels and your short stories, but you also have a book of um, essays. I guess it was your first sort of nonfiction book, essays yeah. making babies, uh, stumbling into motherhood, which some of these are very funny. I mean, you've got some funny moments in them, but also. Touching, what, you wrote some of these for magazines and things well, like that? Well, for, for um, journals more than magazines. Um, I think the first one was written for the London Review of Books. Um, some of the, and then they went places that I hadn't, like here, they've gone here. They've, that I had never really thought. <laughs> that, that it would make it over here. Yeah, no, I, I didn't, I, yeah. And, um, you know, maybe nine years after it was published in, in the UK. And I wrote it because I, a, a friend of mine was setting up a review called the Dublin Review, which is a very good uh, journal. And he said, would you write about the birth of your child? And I said, okay. So uh, as I was writing it, I realized that I had a chance to put it, put it down on paper. Uh, they, you know, this is a place where cameras, nine years ago, there were no cameras in these rooms. <laughs> And there are now, they're all reality TV shows, but maternity wards or whatever. But I, I, I realized if I could put it down properly, then I would have it, then I wouldn't forget it. And it would be like this, the, the endless pictures that we take of our children, it would be a picture that I would have. Um, and so I wrote it for my future self, uh, really. And then a woman came up to me at some event and said, I just, I read your piece in the Dublin Review and she was crying. Oh, and I thought, oh my goodness! And she wasn't crying because it was sad, you know. And I thought I'd touched by it. Yeah, well, yeah. she had been there too. And um, I thought, well, this is something I've never made a reader cry like that before, or at least not that you've seen. That might be the case. No. Yeah. No. It's interesting that you said that it's almost a way of uh, taking pictures of what happened because you have a collection of stories called taking yeah. pictures. Yeah. Yeah. So. Talk a little bit about the difference in writing something that's nonfiction and then writing something that's fiction, but both of them are sort of taking pictures. Well, I think your, your ideas about yourself as a writer change over the years, but I think I had, starting out, a very adolescent idea that I would present myself to the page as I was, as fully as I could, at any stage of my life from where I was now. So I didn't worry about becoming an older writer, for example, because that, that change would be interesting too, you know, that I would just try to be fully there, you know, and bring whatever I had to the act of writing at the time. Um, so that is a kind of snapshot then. Uh, in its complexity, it's also a, a snapshot. So, so yes, I, I, it was very easy for me to be fully present writing the baby book um, because I was excited and delighted and interested and wanted to put it down. I just wanted to put it down. Yeah. Well, let's have you read a little bit from the... the I see, I haven't opened that book in nine years. Really? Oh, no, nope. haven't. No, nope. and it's. I think it's new out in this country. It is new so out in the states. Yeah, it's funny. And and the one I picked out, and you may want to change this up. That's fine with me. But I picked out the glass wall. I can't remember that Thinking, at all. Thinking, I don't remember that. Exactly. <laughs> in a way, it kind oh, of made yeah. me think of the character in your novel, The Forgotten Waltz. I almost wondered if it was a precursor to her in some ways. Well, uh, yeah, no. Gina it doesn't have children, and Sean does. Um, and that is a huge difference between them. And, uh, but I've always been interested, as I avoid reading this, I have always been interested in the difference between, or the connection between romantic love or sexual love and uh, family love, which is a theme in The Gathering. I mean, this idea of a chosen, if we do choose, uh, romantic love, um, and this unchosen or given love of the family um, and I spent most of my 30s facing a glass wall on the other side of this wall were women with babies mothers you might call them on my side were women who simply were 
It didn't seem possible that I would ever move through the glass. I couldn't even imagine I couldn't even imagine what it was like in there. All I could see were scattered reflections of myself, while on the other side, real women, interesting phrase, real women moved with great slowness, like distantly sighted whales. <laughs> I always assumed I would have... I always assumed I would have children, but only dimly. I never thought about when. I was reared in the 70s by a woman who had been reared in the 30s, and we were both agreed that getting pregnant was the worst thing that could happen to a girl. <laughs> my mother thought it would ruin my marriage prospects, and I thought it would ruin my career prospects. Same thing, really, by the different lights of our times. And when do you stop being a girl? By career, I meant something more than salary. I could not get pregnant, I thought, until I had gotten somewhere, until I knew who I was, until I was in some way more thoroughly myself. These things are important. They do happen, but they often happen late, and you can hardly tell people to stop dithering. I look at women in their 30s with their noses pressed up, up against the glass, and all I can tell them, wave, is that life in here on the other side is just the same, only much better and more difficult. I see them wondering, does he love me and do I love him? And will I have to give up smoking? And what about my job? And I don't want to be that fat woman in the supermarket. And what if it is autistic and don't they cry all the time? And I want to say, it's fine. More than that, when I first had a child, I was so delighted I wanted to say, do whatever it takes. Children seem to be such an absolute good, independent of the relationship that made them, that I wanted to say, buy one if you have to, <laughs> or hurry. I was wrong, of course, because most women are more interested in sexual love than they are in the maternal variety. They want a man more than they want children, or at least they want it first. Still, it is good to keep in mind the fact in a world where sexual partners can come and go, children remain. They are our enduring love. I stole that phrase from Ian McHugh and I didn't even notice. That was lovely and, and funny, which a lot of this book is. So, Making Babies, Stumbling into Motherhood by Anne Enright, who's the author of The Gathering, and then most recently, her novel, The Forgotten Waltz. You're listening right now to New Letters on the Air, and I'm Angela Elam, and we're recording this at the Kansas City Public Library downtown, and it's wonderful to have you here. So It's lovely to be here. Yeah, it's great. It's really Remembering terrific. things I wrote a long time ago. <laughs> Well, in, in some ways I thought, oh, that's not so far off from how Gina sort of feels in the, in the book, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah, I suppose I did understand that trepidation very fully. Um, I experienced it to the max, basically. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's interesting, too, because in The Gathering, uh, the main character is a mother of two and is going through all the stuff that she's going in. It's almost like, Gina in The Forgotten Waltz is the flip side of that character of who she could have been had she not gone down that path. Yeah, they are bookend, um, uh, bookends for me. I mean, they, 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 they do talk to each other as books because they're both first-person narrators. They're both very involved in the limits of the voice. Gina does a different thing. I mean, The, the Forgotten Waltz does a different thing with the first-person voice because although... We, we listen to Gina, and I hope we are interested and delighted. We're also a little bit uh, sometimes annoyed with her. We sometimes don't necessarily believe her. We sometimes wonder, does, how much does she believe what she's saying? Um, and this, uh, it's very much like, I suppose, listening to a friend when they have a, when, you, when, you, when you're testing or questioning what they're saying, for their own good, perhaps. You know what I mean? Um, anyway, the, 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 the reader's relationship to Gina is very different to the reader's relationship to Veronica. Um, and it is Gina's progress through delight and denial, or bliss and denial, into 
reality and the reality of and real love that is the story of the book. Um, so it's like Gina realizes what we realize only a little bit later. Mm. That's, that's a good way to put it, I think. So. Well, I mean, she's, she's not lying, but we have many different ways of describing our lives to ourselves. I mean, I think that's what stories are. Right, right. And, and sometimes you, you don't really, you, you are lying to yourself, but you don't even realize Isn't that. Isn't it wonderful? So. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of the time you're lying to yourself and you don't really realize it. No, maybe not. No, that's too sweeping a statement. <laughs> but we wouldn't, or, or uh, we wouldn't survive without, I mean, you could call them lies, you could call them delusions or illusions or dreams or hopes. We wouldn't, we couldn't live without that. That's what keeps us trucking along. I think it is. Well, I thought that I would have you read one more short piece from um, The Forgotten Waltz, and this is much later in the novel. And it's, again, um, juxtaposing uh, the now and the past. And Gina is thinking back uh, when she was little and having to do with her. This is a scene okay. with her father. Yeah. And uh, I love the writing in this particular scene, but you can yeah, if, if you wonder why in this book, you, if you wonder at the, the cru tiny but crucial distance between what is said and what is true in this book uh, and where it comes from, you'd have to look at her relationship with her father, who was a great drinker. And uh, drinkers are, are also great liars. He, um, he, he dies of um, something peculiar to do with his bile duct, I think. I can't remember how she phrases it, which is also known as cirrhosis of the liver, you know. But the way that the family uh, deals with his drinking is the first set of denials that sets her up for, for the subsequent ones. I'm making her sound much less fun than she is in the book. There I am on my father's knee, a little pieta. I am waiting to be tickled, playing dead. My father lifts one hand and holds it high. Is that the way? I'm dead. I start to wriggle to the floor, and as I slip across his knees, he pounces, finding the spaces between my ribs and digging in. By the time I've hit the carpet, I am beside myself. I am out of my skin, stuck to the spinning floor. I am tied to my body where his fingers hold me together as I fly apart. No, no. My father tickling me from the sofa as I squirm on the ground, my shoulders churning into the carpet. Oh, no. His cigarette is clamped between his inrolled lips. He gathers my ankles in one big hand. Then he turns to leave the cigarette in the ashtray. Oh, the mouse, he says. Oh, the mouse. And his fingers dance and scrabble across the soft underside of my foot. Being dead was like being tickled, except that when you flew out of your body, you never came back. Oh, just read the last little bit. Yeah, this is actually in her most serious mode. When I was twelve, when I was twelve or so, I used to practice astral flying. It must have been a fashion then. <laughs> I lay on my back in bed, and when I was fully heavy, too heavy to move, I got up in my mind and left the house. I went down the stairs and out the front door. I walked or I drifted along the street. If I wanted to, I flew. And I imagined or I saw every single detail of the passing world, every fact about the hall or the stairs and the street beyond. The next day, I would go out to look for things I had noticed for the first time the night before. And I found them too, or I thought I had. The pubs have shut. There are shouts in the distance and the screams of girls. I lean my forehead against the cold glass as the traffic lights change and change again. It is time for bed, but I don't want to go to bed. I want to keep them company another little while, my father and mother, dispersed as they are along the sweet, bright arc of the dead. Mm. 
I think that shows that living on, on different levels, you know, that, that all of us do in our lives that we don't always recognize, not just in the here and now, but, you know, how we're haunted by the past and it's part of the present. And I don't know, I, I just think you capture that very well in your writing. And Thank you. I don't think it's always easy to do. So um, I, I know some of you, because we've got a lot of people here from the Irish, what's it called again? The, the Irish Center. Well, I should be able to remember that. But we've got a lot of people here from the Irish Center. And, you know, I don't know. I read somewhere that this uh, is almost a metaphor for Ireland. I wasn't quite sure I couldn't pick it out. Do you feel that's true, the Forgotten Waltz? In any way? Well, if I knew what Ireland was, I'd knew if it was, <laughs> I'd be able to answer that. A metaphor for, for uh, certainly the uh, economic shift is, uh, is there, the recent economic shift. But Ireland is and such a, a death of sorts in some ways, too. So, yeah. well, having to deal with the home and then. Ireland has always way. lost something, you know. Loss is one of our subjects. I sometimes feel like saying, oh, what have we lost now? <laughs> <laughs> As if there was something true and authentic. I mean, it comes from the nationalism, uh, uh, you know, the, and the, the work of Yeats and, uh, uh, and the foundation of the state, that there's some idea of a beautiful past that is always receding and always we're trying to recapture it. But I think that it was, a, 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 you know, it's an originating myth and not necessarily true. Well, you guys, thank you very much for coming. And thanks to the Irish Center and all of the people who work at the library and most especially to Anne Enright for joining us. And she's got books for sale. So make sure you go out there and buy them and she'll sign them for you. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.